Hello, Barry Winbolt here with another episode of How to Get a Better Handle on Life. I'm joined today by Philip Cargom. He's a psychologist and author of some 20 plus books, uh, non-fiction mainly, but also recently fiction. And until recently, for 32 years, he was the chosen chief of the order of bards, ovates and druids. We're going to be talking about all sorts of stuff, I guess. I'm aiming to find out more about what makes a writer and a few tips and hints that might be useful to aspiring writers or people who have always wanted to write that book but never got round to it. I've known Philip for a good number of years now. Our lives run on a parallel course, but we do slightly different things, of course. And I thought it'd be really interesting to prolong one of our regular conversations and record it for this podcast. Well, good morning. Hello, Philip. Morning, Barry. Lovely to be here. Well, I thought that we could talk about... So that we have regular conversations. Once a month or so, we meet up and chat, yeah. and they go in all sorts of directions. And it just seemed so enriching for me, but also... I've been talking more about two people who are interested in writing and about people who are interested in writing because I was asked to give a talk on the subject and I noticed that there was a big upturn in interest during lockdown. People were writing more in all sorts of ways. So, great. I thought, let me talk to some writers I know. And you were naturally the, the one I came to first on the list because you live close to me and we talk regularly. So... Sure. Where are we going to go with this? What do you think if... I mean, you must get people who come to you and say, oh, I've always wanted to be a writer. Has that happened to you? Sure. Yes, yes, it happens quite a bit. And and, and gra gradually over the years, I've come up with, uh, with you know, I suppose, key bits of advice um, that, that, I, that I suggest to people. Okay. Yeah. And do they take those key bits of advice, do you think? Has anybody fed uh, back to you that that was really useful? Yes, yes, I think so. Over over time, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, because I certainly have, and uh, mm. th th because obviously in my therapy work too. And and by the way, I should say to those who don't know, Philip is also a therapist and psychologist. So you work with people creatively as well, just as I do, yeah. in different different yeah. areas. Um, and I've had artists and writers come to me because they were stuck or because they wanted to get going on something. And one of the things that I stumbled on myself with my own writing really is that creativity don't wait for inspiration you know creativity doesn't happen to you it's something you make happen yes yes there's a nice quote from Tchaikovsky where he says you've got to meet inspiration halfway which <laughs> which is you know you don't expect it just to arrive unbidden uh, which it can do sometimes it can arrive unbidden you know you're you're taking a walk and suddenly um what's called la ligne donnée the the given line uh, with the first line of a poem or a, of a, a story or whatever uh, comes to you. So sometimes it does come unbidden, but usually you've got to meet it halfway, as Tchaikovsky says. Yes. Well, you know, we don't script these conversations and already we've gone way off what I would have scripted. And, <laughs> and I love that thing about the unbidden line because yes. I was talking to another writer yesterday, actually, socially, a friend of mine and uh, Jeff Green. He'll be on, on here at a later date on, on an episode. He's agreed to do that. But we were talking about just this, the fact that there are scraps of paper all over the house with, with that one. You, you have that idea, you know, yeah. uh, you have that idea and you, you jot it down somewhere. And I've got dozens, if not hundreds of them. And I try and capture the, the line and then something that reminds me about what was going through my mind at that time. And often these turn into podcasts or or uh, a post on my blog or something like that. Does that happen to you? It, it does happen to me. And the one thing that I am bad about is that I, I've got dozens of notebooks of different kinds. I've got, uh, so I make these notes sometimes electronically uh, and, you know, I have files with sort of essay ideas and book ideas and so on. Um, and but what I should have done, I should have started doing, you know, 30, 40 years ago is, is putting them all in in the same place. Well, I guess we all have our quirks and I have got 
uh, goodness knows how many, because like so many people, I love notebooks. And, yes. you know, I'll go somewhere, especially when I'm traveling, I'll find a notebook in a stationer's. I can't stay out of stationery shops. I'll find a notebook in Spain or the USA or something like that. And I will keep my notes for that trip. And then it never sees the light of day again. Absolutely. It goes in a cupboard. Yeah. And then maybe yeah. 10 years later, you're clearing the cupboard out and you find it. And you say, oh, that was good. I could have made a story out of that or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. still can in the time that remains what? for e us e to do e these exactly. things. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think then? What what If somebody is, let's say they've been doodling a bit they've been writing a bit they've they've been through lockdown and they've developed this habit of writing and we're getting back into active duty now so to speak and maybe that habit's slipping a bit and they their great plans during lockdown uh, look tenuous maybe they're not going to make it onto the written page after all so w what would your pearl of wisdom be to for somebody to keep going with that sure okay well i think the very first rule or idea uh, to get across to somebody who isn't writing is that there are no rules. This is a this is a, a, a work, creative work in which there are no rules. So right from the beginning, what we're doing is we're going to spend you and I are going to spend an hour giving advice to people. And the, the first piece of advice is you don't have to take any of this advice because for you, like the, you know, the psychoanalyst um, Carl Jung said, you know, that the shoe that fits one foot will pinch another. And, you know, so, so what works for you won't necessarily work for somebody else. So take everything we say, I would suggest with a pinch of salt, because you may be different. However, having said that, the, the, the advice can be extremely useful. The reason why there are no rules is this. Look at what one of the latest uh, books that's up for a Booker Prize at the moment. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's a book that has virtually no punctuation. I think it's got three full stops. Uh, it sounds horrendous to me, but it's up for the Booker Prize. If I had written something like that, I, uh, my, I would imagine that you know nobody would give it a second chance. You'd show it to people and friends. Having and said that, sorry if I can just butt in quickly but because it, this is the great thing about conversations they you never know what it's going to trigger in your own mind and in fact I, I always say to people in therapy you know uh, people who are, who won't go to therapy listen your mind will yeah, work exactly. completely differently when you start speaking to somebody else yeah. uh, whether or not you discuss your problems it's just yeah. such an uplifting experience if you use it properly but anyway um and writing's a little bit like that and conversation is a bit like that but what's occurred to me and the reason i interrupted you was that i think there are a couple of levels here there's the process of creating your work in other words writing getting your bum on the seat and sticking at it and finding the routine that suits you but then there's the question of actually your writing style and people talk about finding their voice which may or may not suit some people but the question of mm -hmm. writing style and if you are going to uh, look at rules in that case it's quite handy to understand a few basic rules about how you construct a sentence and how you, mm. you, you know, how you lay the thing out. But you can always get an editor to do that for you. Yes, but ha however, having said that, if you write fiction, I mean, one of the big learning curves for me was having written nonfiction for whatever, 20 years or something. I, I was asked by a publisher to write a novel and I started writing fiction um, and I thought that I could do it in the way that I had learnt to do non-fiction, which was really just with my own kind of common sense and, and trying to be as clear as possible and all the rest of it. And I discovered that there are there are certain uh, rules in fiction, uh, like, you know, point of views, for instance, and so on, that if you don't, you can, again, you can choose to break them. But if you break them, you know, you break it at your peril. So for those listening, the title of the book was The Prophecies. Mm. And I found it absolutely fascinating and would, would recommend it because it covers history, it covers uh, druidry, it covers the Knights Templars, I think you've got in there. But also it's set in the Second World War in Brittany. I love the part about Brittany and your knowledge. So you must have done a lot of research for that as well as your yes, that took own five understanding years to of write your that topic. Book, actually. Just, uh, just one thing I wanted to say about the, the no rules thing, to just give you a very specific example, because, of course, it's a bit extreme. The example of the, the book that has no punctuation is a bit extreme. I, I read somewhere in a book on writing that you shouldn't write during the day and then 
before you write the next, the following day, uh, go back and read what you've written and car and edit edit it as you go along. You shouldn't do that. You should just keep going. So you know, write your X thousand words on day one, and then on day two, just keep going, keep going, keep going, and only go back and edit it at the end. And whoever wrote that piece of advice was very dogmatic about it. So I felt that I was making a mistake when I found I couldn't do that. And I kept rereading what I'd written the day before and editing it on the on the hoof. And then I came across, I don't know, Ernest Hemingway or somebody saying this, this my routine is I write. And then in the morning I wake up, have a cup of coffee and read what I wrote the day before, edit it. And that gets me going. I get back into the story and then I carry on. And I thought, oh, thank heavens for that. He, he, he's recommending what I want to do, but have felt that I shouldn't because it was a rule. Yeah. My process really is that I might be working on three or four things at a time. And so I do jump about and I will always mm. reread what I've written up to the present point. And that is my springboard it, it, exactly. into the rest it of what like I'm going to write today. And I think, I think you know, if if thinking about somebody starting out with this, um, you know, one of one of the really important things to 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 work on is the the, the inner critic, because what what's going to happen? I think most of us will have a whole host of voices saying, you know, uh, you know, look, there are so many books already in the world, and you know, why would anybody interested be interested in what you have to say, and so on. And so I have a little sort of technique for that, which is to imagine these inner critics, and I invite them to tea. And so I've, you know, I've got a schoolmistress who tells me I don't know how to use grammar properly, and I have a lawyer. You know, if you write nonfiction, for me, there's a lawyer around who says things like, are you absolutely sure? You know, can you prove that? And uh, so on. Mine, mine is my American editor years ago. And yeah. the only bit of journalistic training I ever did was in New York for a publishing company. They took me to New York and they gave me this crash course in two weeks. And I had uh, two fabulous editors, an editorial director and an editor directly above me. And I've still got yes. the voice on my shoulder saying, how yeah. do you know yeah. that? In other words, have you fact checked? Have you exactly. checked it from so, free sources? So, so you, there are these these yeah. you know these critics, and for some people it might be the voice of a of a school teacher telling them they were hopeless or their parents or whatever. But but I think the trick is yeah. Yeah. don't ignore, listen to them, invite them to tea in your imagination, give them a cup of tea and a cake, and say, okay, you know, tell you know, listen to them, and then and then say, well, thank you very much for your opinion but I'm not going to listen to you anymore. That's enough now. Uh, you go away and then set them aside and recognize that they're, they're not going to go away necessarily. They might keep popping back every so often. Uh, and you just politely listen for a few moments and then yeah, set them aside. Yeah. It's a bit like mindfulness. You know, when you're meditating, if you, if you desperately try to dismiss thoughts, you won't succeed because they'll keep sort of coming at you. So what you do is you, you're just not attached. You let the thought drift into your mind. You say, Oh, I'm, I've lost my focus on my breath or whatever it is. And then and then you just you just let it drift away, you know. Well that reminds me of that process of giving these thoughts mm. an identity or a set of identities is what the narrative therapists would and some others uh, like me would call externalizing. So you create a character right. for the thing that is the problem. So for example, uh something I quite frequently use is how does this um this habit you've got this habit of yeah. uh drinking too much alcohol for example of you're 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 in the in the thrall of mm. the alcohol so really that's like an unwanted guest push pushing you into something so how does it bully you into behaving that way because you've just told me it's not in your normal range of behavior but when you start drinking this bully takes over so the bully is then the externalized identity of the problem great what a great great idea and, yeah. and it's like putting something on a flip chart you know when you've got it out there and it, and it loses its power doesn't it? it's a bit like you know in group therapy every, everybody has these feelings that i'm the odd one out i don't really fit in here and as soon as you say it you immediately feel that you do fit, fit in a bit more yeah I think the yeah. other thing about judgment is um, you have all these voices and, OK, you 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 set them aside, you you get cracking on, on your work. And one of the things I've discovered over time is that you should never trust yourself to judge your own work. In other words, I can write I can write um, I can write something and read it the next day and think it's terrible. Yeah. 
And then two days later, I pick it up again. I think, hey, this is rather good. And then a week later, I think it's terrible. Um, there's a book I wrote called Lessons in Magic that I put in a drawer for 10 years because I didn't think it was any good. And then I, I have one evening, uh, I had a free evening, and I pulled it out of the drawer and read it. It's a very short book. And I thought, actually, this is rather good. I quite like this and published it, you know, and it's been really successful. So um, although you might say that sort of deep down, you know, you, you know when your stuff's good. But I think what you have to be really wary of your own judgment. And of course, you know, we all have heard these stories of people who destroy their work. They, they, they read it and then they throw it in the fire or, and then regret it. Isn't there a famous story? What was it? Rossetti or uh, somebody where they were buried with their book and, 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 the, and the lover had the grave dug up and the book taken out. I, I, yeah. I haven't heard that, but I can, I can believe it. And I, I was watching something on a composer. Um, I've forgotten which one it was. Um, but uh, anyway, I was, uh, and who, who mm. in a fit of pique destroyed all his manuscripts. And uh, uh, so there you go. And like you, um, and to anybody, to you listening out here, you know, out there, uh, I would say that um, I absolutely concur. I agree with what Philip's saying because my stuff, when I've written it, however long I've slaved over it or if I just dash it off quickly, which happens very rarely, yeah. by the way, uh, I never like it. I, I never like it. And time and again, I find things, and quite often it gets published because quite often it's commissioned. It's something, whether it's a video yeah. or a or written work. And, and then I'll come across it later and I think... Mm. Oh, that's, yeah, actually, yeah. that's okay. I can stand by that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and I think also this this sense of humility is quite important because new writers mm -hmm. can be a bit precious about their words, and it can. I always remember the first time my wife get when we first knew each other. She gave me something, and I was already an established editor, and she gave me something to uh, just handed me something she was going to put on an article or a post she was going to put on the web and without even thinking I took it from her said thank you and read it it was about a page and a half two pages and mm. my hand automatically reached for the red pen and I just did what editors do because mm, yeah. I'd gone into editing mode out of husband mode <laughs> husband <laughs> mode says oh lovely well done editor mode says right let's say no no apostrophes here no 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 and <laughs> Well, it, it almost separated us for good, you know. It was, <laughs> and we joke about it now, and she's fine about it now. And in fact, she won't yeah. ask if she doesn't want some some input. And I I have to say, by the way, she writes a lot better than me. She writes, she's an intuitive writer, and time and again, I will go to her when I'm trying to get a a catchphrase or a soundbite or a a starting point for something. And bearing in mind, I write advice columns and stuff I, as well. I think that's a really good point about if you if you're lucky enough to have a partner or friend who who can fulfil that role, it's fantastic. I mean, Stephanie, my wife. She's fantastic. I'll show her stuff I've written, and and she'll she, she won't edit it in in the in a sort of classic editor's way, but she'll occasionally say, "Why don't you flip that sentence around? Totally flip it around. Start start yeah. where you ended yeah. and end where you started. You know, and so on. And and that's fantastic if you if you have somebody who you can share your work with, like you know. And what what we kind of nudging towards maybe is the idea that actually. The words you put on the paper, you know, the construction, all of the rest, the narrative, is raw material. And pottery comes to mind. You shape it. It's Sorry. malleable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, once you've got yes, the... that really that's that's how I, I wrote the first the first piece that I wrote. That's how I did it. I was running a children's charity called the Children's Hours Trust, and the very charismatic and dynamic woman who'd uh, founded this. It was a way of working in psychotherapy for children. Had a whole mass of notes she'd written, and she couldn't shape it into a document. It was a, essentially a booklet of about I don't know twenty pages, twenty five pages, thirty pages, something. Like that. And uh, she gave it to me, and so this, this was really the first piece of work that I did uh, to put together. And um, I, the perfectionist in me, just couldn't do it. I, I found it very frustrating. And then in the end, I thought, well, damn it, what I'll do is I'll just try my, I'll throw it throw it together in the way I think is best and then I'll give it to somebody else to rework so I did that so that thought freed me up to do the job I did it when I looked at it 
prior to giving it to somebody, I realized, actually, this is okay. This flow, it flows. So if you tell yourself, uh, it's almost like a trick. You can trick yourself. You can say, listen, it doesn't matter how it comes out because I can always rework this. You know, when I when I got the biggest book contract I ever got, I was with this yeah, very high flying yeah. um, literary agent in New York, and I was sort of starstruck because I was up on the on a sort of penthouse uh, sort of office in Manhattan with this uh, Broadway literary agent and all the rest of it. And he said, "Hey, look, I want to work with you. Um, you know, don't worry. Uh, you know, if it doesn't come out right, you know, uh, we can feed it through somebody else's typewriter, uh, which is <laughs> uh, which was the same idea, really. It's like just get it out there, and then you can rework it." Yeah. Yes, and it also it, it comes back to the point I was uh, sort of leaning towards earlier, which is there are different roles here. I often used to tell students, you know, when you've written your work, when you've written your essay or your thesis or whatever it is you're submitting. Then you've got mm. to change hats and you've got to edit your work. And I, and I touched on being precious earlier, you know, and you must not fall in love with it because yeah. when you do, and, and it still happens to me, you know, I think, oh, I really like that paragraph. I don't want it to go, but yeah. I know that it has to, or, or that sentence. or well, well, you know that famous piece of advice, and I've forgotten who it was, who said you've got to learn to kill your little darlings. <laughs> and that is, that is, you know, just so true it's uh, it's such a painful thing to recognize that that one little florid turn of phrase that you've come up yeah. with is precisely the one that you've got to strike out well yes absolutely and the cliches and and all of the or uh, was it orwell's rules for writing you know those uh that he that he wrote an essay saying you know these are the things you should never do and then finishes by saying as you have yeah, yeah. but the the final rule is you ignore all the rules um, but, you know, never yeah. use a phrase that you wouldn't use in normal speech. Never use a foreign, foreign phrase. You know, watch out for cliches uh, and all of that. You know, it was a and it was a, it was yeah. a cloudy yeah. morning on Dartmoor, you know, and these yeah, yes, obvious it. sort yes. of it may have been, but you, know, <laughs> but you don't say it like that. You know, you, you, so, you I think the point you ways. made about the changing so, uh, hats is it, it's a different a persona almost you're working with or a different part of the mind the editor versus the 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 sort of the inspired writer and of course if you can you can flip i mean i find it quite easy to flip between the two so so that i you know like i said i you know i will i will write you know x thousand words and then i'll edit it and then i'll carry on writing and then i'll go back and edit it some people might need to let the stuff settle and, and then come to it at a completely different time but you can sort of flip but they are they are different different modes and i i think i got you know the point you made about uh, not being able to judge your stuff and then reading it later when i really got it was once when a publisher rang me up and asked me to write the back cover blurb for a book and she wanted it within the hour and i was furious i was thinking this is hopeless you know i did this contract a year ago i spent a year writing the book and suddenly they ring me up and they want so i was very grumpy so I bashed out this um, few paragraphs grumpily. Years later, I, I looked, I happened to look at this book and read the back cover blurb. And I thought, my God, this is good. Did I write this? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so I, read, I, cut, and I worked with a colleague and friend, Dave the Bard, who's a musician, and he does lots of um, gigs. And he said that it's the same thing for his music. He'll play a gig and he he's discovered over the years that his judgment isn't necessarily correct. He'll either play a gig and think it was great. And, you know, his partner, or other people will say, well, that was great, but not that great, Dave, actually, you know, or, or, you know, more often the reverse, he'll play a gig and think it's bad. <laughs> and people will say that was wonderful. That was the best you've ever done. So that's quite a relief. If you know that you, again, you listen to your, there's no point in not in trying to suppress your inner judge, your inner critic. You've got to listen to your own judgment about it, but don't necessarily uh, obey it or take it seriously. Yeah, give them house room, but don't let them yeah. take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to, to sort of summarise what we've covered so far, because I'm thinking of this now. I'm thinking I put another hat on, and I'm thinking: yeah. imagine that you're a listener listening to this, and imagine that you are actually interested in becoming a writer or doing more writing yourself or improving your writing. Are these two guys yeah. prattling on in a way that's going to keep me engaged? And 
so I thought, well, maybe I should punctuate it by saying, well, so far we've talked about lots of things and we've covered the idea of uh, creativity doesn't have any specific form. You make your own rules. You, you should get it down on paper and review it later, but you should choose a working method that suits you. Don't be hidebound. You have to give space to these critics who inevitably are there. And I have to say, actually, although I resent them, they are my friend as well because they keep me on the straight and narrow and uh, they, they do remind me to do things. Mm. So those are some of the points we've covered. And what's coming up? What Have you, have you got kind of a set of points you'd make for writers just so we can give a, a sneak preview? I don't need to know what they are, but if you've got sort of, are we going to give people something concrete? They can, what, what are the takeaways from this uh, <laughs> event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. No, I've got a, I've got a number of points that I'd really love to get a, 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 across. One of the things is about fame and money, because when you write, I think yeah, there's going to be the part of you that wants to write because you love to write. You want to express yourself. It's just in your blood, as it were. You know, I think often the best reason for writing is you can't help it. You know, you just this is just what you do, you know, or what you want to do. But inevitably, d dreams of fame and fortune uh, do come into the picture. So I think, you know, the thing to do is to to accept uh, that one might want to be rich and famous, but also the reality check that, that the vast majority of writers don't earn enough to keep body and soul together. I mean, there are all sorts of interesting studies that you can find online of writers' annual earnings, average earnings and all the rest of it. Most publishing houses are kept going by a tiny percentage of books that sell. You know, so J.K. Rowling's uh, publisher, will she will be funding all the other authors who don't sell enough copies to break even on, on the thing. It cuts both ways too, actually, Philip, because I found that mm. uh, it was a breakthrough moment for me with my first book was uh, I, I really got quite stuck with it. And um, I realised it was about this feeling for me of, oh, I'm mm. going to put this on the page. It's going out there forever. And what if I'm wrong? What if I make a mistake? People are going to judge me about this. And then I had this, this tremendous flash of insight, it seemed to me at the time, which was, don't kid yourself. Yes. If they sell a thousand, you'll be doing well, you know. And um, yes. So get over yourself, you know. Just get on with it, will you? And I, absolutely. I was, I think from it, that it, point exactly. on, exactly. The thought that thought becomes liberating instead of depressing. It becomes liberating. There's a guy called Stephen Pressfield yep. who writes. He's written a couple of books that are good, good to read. The the the, the art of oh, yes. the war of yeah. art. And nobody wants to read your shit, I think, is, is the other one. As an example of writing, he's got the most extraordinary study. He is totally unputdownable for me. You pick pick his books up and you can't put them down. They're nonfiction, but they, he's just got a way of writing that just drags you by the collar through the book and you come out the other end. And maybe there's a link here to writing, too, to drag us back to the subject, yeah. because it's about, I think, authenticity. You know, if you're not addressing something, you know, in, yeah. in, in therapy, in life, we've all had questions yeah. we've wanted to ask other people and we haven't dared at that moment. And I think, personally, I think people appreciate it. They come to therapy, they're paying money, they, they, they want to go away feeling better. If we just do what everybody else does, we're not earning our keep, in my view. So, so you know, we can afford to be ourselves. And I think in the same way as a writer, if you're just going to do what everybody else does, why would anybody well, exactly. want to read Well, exactly. When you, you read Stephen Pressfield, that's the really almost instant effect you get. My God, this guy's being real. He's talking. He's talking directly at me. No holds barred. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let's use nakedness as a as a sort of uh, analogy here. Because I think when some people approach writing, that they treat it like having to dress up. How can it? And actually, it's actually in a way coming from a sense of inferiority. It's like how can I express my thoughts in the most beautiful sort of way that ends up being florid and 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 over overdressed, as it were. I think that is very relevant. I think that's a very good analogy, uh, actually, yeah. for life as well, yeah. isn't it, really? Yeah. And the vulnerability, the nakedness, as you call it, you know, is about putting yourself out there. Putting yourself out there, yeah, yeah. The, the, the naked truth, as it were, just being as, as direct and as clear as... And honest with yourself. Didn't yeah. you once say the best writers... I seem to remember talking when I was going to give a talk somewhere and I rang around a few people, that the... the you thought that a real benefit to a writer was to have examined themselves, 
to have a, a level of self-awareness or something? Was it possibly? Not you I don't know. That? I don't know. I think. Well, I'll attribute it to you with my apologies to the original. But that, that point came up that people who are prepared to inspect themselves, i.e. go through therapy or a similar process, or they're on a, a journey through life and are prepared to learn from it, are going to make yes, better writers. Yes, I think writers. so. And certainly writing fiction. I mean, if one's characters can be, uh, you know, the more introspection or the more therapy, the more, I don't know, um, uh, experiences and sort of in, in, internal work you've done, uh, I think that's going to pay dividends in writing about character because that's the thing about it. I've just thought of something mm. else too, um, which is that when you're doing anger management with kids, for example, one of the things that you notice about them is they have a very impoverished lexicon, a very impoverished vocabulary mm. for describing their emotional states. And in fact, so the first step, as is as with some other situations, is to help people recognize the feelings that are going on inside and identify yes. them as a separate activity from their thoughts and actually um, give them names. Because, you know, if you can't separate being a little angry with being yeah. totally pissed off or something, to use the vernacular, you know, if you've, if you've got different names for mm. different degrees yeah. of annoyance, say... Um, then of course you can put a, you can get a handle on it. You can actually uh, grab that part. And think, okay, well I'm feeling a bit irritated. I don't want to get to the next stage, yeah. which is which is feeling angry. So yeah. and and so you can intervene more easily. And maybe in writing we're going to need that uh, grasp of vocabulary for human states if we're not to be repetitive and boring. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think that's 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 absolutely correct. So what what about you you said you had a number of points. What what else um have we got to delight just, people well, with? Okay. Just just to finish with the fame and fortune thing. I think the the one huge change that's occurred up until I don't know what 10 years ago or 8 years ago or something like that, if you when you were writing a book there was the very real risk that it would never see the light uh -huh. of day. You know, if I don't get a publisher, I can do vanity. There was always vanity publishing, which was where, which were essentially printers who would print books. And so if you couldn't get your book published, you go to a vanity publisher and suddenly your garage would be full of hundreds of copies of a book and it's down to you to sell it. Uh, but basically, if you didn't get a deal with a publisher, you, nobody would read your book. With um, print on demand and, uh, you know, internet publishing, that doesn't apply. You can tell yourself when you're writing that, OK, I'd like to get an agent. I'd like to get a contract. I'd like to get a big publisher. But actually, you know, it may be better if I publish it myself. I actually may make mm -hmm. more money um, because of the de without going into all that, it's actually, you know, the, the royalties are much better if you self-publish. Um, and at least it will see the light of day so that anybody who writes, they can tell themselves, whatever happens, my book will be yeah. published. So that sort of takes some of the pressure. If you sit yourself down, you say, OK, you want you, you know, you want you want to create this great work or you want to be famous. or you want to write this wonderful book that reaches. Um, look at the story of Rilke, Rainer Maria Rilke, the poet, who wrote this wonderful book called Letters to a Young Poet. It sold, I can't remember, it sold sort of 16 copies or 60 copies or something like that. Nothing when he was alive. It's been in print ever since. It's a fantastic book and it will probably be in print forever. The yeah. uh, okay, so you want uh, another uh, another point is is I don't know whether you and again this may only apply to me and a few people that I've talked to, but I think it's probably true, is that when I when I work on a, a book, I become obsessed by it, obsessed in the sense of it's really the only thing of interest to me, and you know I often say to Stephanie, look, if you climb inside my head, I'm afraid you'll find nothing except the book, and so I will just think about it. I'll go to sleep thinking about, it, I'll wake up thinking, and I'll just focus on it. And um, the danger is you can bore people, um, you know, so, for instance, my book, The Prophecies, because it was about so many topics but, and because it was about difficult topics like good and evil, really, and uh, the, the, the Nazi regime and its sort of occult uh, interests, you know, the, the obsessions of Heinrich Himmler and the Grail and so on and the Grail. So it was, it was all these topics of the Grail. And uh, uh, for five years, I was uh, working with all this stuff. And, um, you know, going to France a lot. And I know I probably drove quite a few people 
are crazy, just endlessly talking about it. And so it's just a little rule I have for myself, which is just to be wary of boring other people with my own topic. I mean, do you find that? Do you become obsessed with the particular topic you're writing on? I do. And I live it while I'm asleep. And I, I, I frequently wake up in the yeah. night. And, uh, you know, you know, the old thing about make a note because it won't be there in the morning if you don't. And that's happened to me a lot. But I've kind of got a self regulating mechanism now where I get all these thoughts in the night. And if they're really important, some of them will be there in the morning. But I don't get that <laughs> so totally absorbed in the project because I have family around me and because hmm. I wouldn't be allowed to. Um, but and, and I have taken myself away, as I know you have, uh, just to get some space for a week or two weeks, because then I can write in at the mm. rhythm I want to write. I eat, sleep, go to the pub, do all of those things just in rotation with no none of the usual constraints of family life, regular meal times, and all that. And and that really has worked very well for me. And it almost didn't matter where I was as long as it was private. It could be a hotel room, an apartment. Uh, as long as I had what I needed around me, it's very interesting that yes, that you know because because I've I've got I've got all I need here at the house, as it were, you know, where, you know all my books and the computers and all that. There's no need for me to go away practically, and yet, as you've said, that that's exactly what I've done because it it does. I think it's I think two things are happening with the the writers' retreat. Actually, one is. Um, getting away from all the distractions of, you know, phone calls and sort of domestic duties and that that tendency to procrastinate. You know, maybe I should just whip round with a Hoover and clean the windows, and maybe I should clean yeah. the gutters while I'm at it. You know, um, and so it takes all those sort of demands away. But something else is going on as well, which I haven't quite figured. It's something. I suppose it's something about a change of scenery. Your brain, your mind is surrounded by different sights and sounds. Partly that. I think for me, it's also that I, I, I know I'm going to that place yes. to do that job. So it's kind of like for a few days beforehand, I can relax. And then when I get there, I put everything into it. And it's almost ritualistic in that I've created a space in which only one thing yes. is going to happen. Uh, you know, I don't bring with me worries about my tax return or feeding the dog or yes. even walking the dog. Uh, I've never actually taken my dog with me when I when I go and do that sort of thing. But I would just put a word in too for romanticising this idea because you should be able to write pretty well anywhere. Of course, there are better places well, and worse places, but in my view, waiting to get the ideal room or the best pencil or the right word processor, yes, as I yes, once yes, did yes. many many years ago, waiting for that is 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 a fool's errand because. You know, if, you, if you're a writer, you will write. And remember, too, that writers aren't necessarily born. You can train yourself to write. You can learn to yes. be a writer. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a really important point, Barry, about don't wait. Uh, I, I finally achieved sort of my ideal writer's environment where I have a whole room full of books, the library downstairs, and then I've mm -hmm. got my study upstairs and a garden to, you know, I've got, you know, and, and, but actually most of my books were written in, in imperfect circumstances with children around and dogs and, you know, the whole works and all that. And then, and yeah. then, and then tearing myself yeah. away. I mean, sometimes I literally, sometimes I literally, especially when I had contracts, Stephanie will not, never let me forget. It was a few days before the end of a contract and she got Beijing flu. And I rang the publisher and said, look, I need an extra week. And he said, no, you've signed a legal document. I want that book on Friday. And there was only a red cabbage and a green cabbage in the, <laughs> in the house. This sounds terrible. And, and, and I said to Ste and Stephanie was in bed. And so I made a soup. I boiled them both and buzzed them through a blender. And I said, look, cabbage is very good for you. It's got all sorts of health properties. Eat this. I've got to keep writing. And um, she's never forgotten that. So, yes, don't wait uh, because the ideal circumstances won't won't come. And the other, the other thing I've found as well about not romanticizing, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it certainly happens to me, is I'll spend months wishing for the perfect circumstances uh, you know, for instance, now I'm longing to get down to some writing, but we're sort of moving our office and we've had the carpets changed and all the rest of it. So there's lots of physical chaos around me that I'm having to um, attend to, which means I can't do the writing I want to do. And, and, and in certain times of my life, that's gone on for months and months where the circumstances just aren't right. There have been too many other demands. 
finally you get what you want you know you pack your computer in the car and you drive off and you're in the cottage in the country with nothing to do and you sit down and there's a sort of moment of panic where where the gods say huh you've got what you want right now get on with it yeah well yeah. that's that's the perpetual dilemma yeah. isn't it because all the time we can escape writing much as we love it i'm speaking i'm using the plural here but much as one loves writing, the more you can escape it, the easier it is to, to, to live. To live. Yes, <laughs> because... exactly. And suddenly you're faced with days, blank days, where there's nothing to do, but get on with the job you, you've been telling yourself you've wanted to do. And suddenly it's maybe the last thing you want to do. Well, I remember when um, um, I had not written a book for probably six or seven years at that time. This was in about 2009. And... Um, my late wife had recently died a year earlier and I was all at sea as you can imagine and a publisher rang me and said do you still want to write that book that we spoke about I'd met him at a literary at a, at a book launch for a colleague uh, at the yeah. university in London and he said do you still want to write that book and I can remember where I was sitting I was sitting in the top of a multi-story car park in Brighton looking out at the sea just parking the car and thinking mm. great it's my salvation you know, I can, I can, yeah. yes, this will give me a project. I'll, I'll feel grounded. And actually, it was the worst decision I could have made because uh, I was in no fit state to string my thoughts together. I'd been writing blog posts. I'd been writing training manuals. I hadn't actually sat down and written chapter after chapter after chapter for uh, probably seven or eight years at that time. And I think I'd trained myself out of the concentration span that you need to sit and write for two or three hours. I was used to writing for an hour or two, and there's the result. And mm. suddenly I had to think in terms of months or even years. And as it turned out, it was uh, about two years and I uh, missed my deadline several times. But, but in the end, uh, the result stands and uh, it, was, it was okay. The point I'm making is sometimes don't be put off if you find that it's hard to write in long stints. Just write in short stints. And, and that work idea up. of chunking yeah, yeah. is is really helpful. You know, if 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 you tell yourself you want to write a hundred thousand word novel, you know, um, and you st it, it can just seem insurmountable. Or if you get a contract to write a nonfiction book, even if it's shorter, say fifty thousand words, something like, that, it can seem insurmountable. But if you just do a few pages every day, before you can say Bob's your uncle, you know, three three months have passed, and you've got a stack of of writing behind you. So so. And even writing, I find even writing one paragraph. Yeah. You know, one paragraph, one idea, then write another paragraph, another idea. Yeah. I'm talking about nonfiction now. Another paragraph, another idea. It eventually bolt the whole thing together. Yes. And then the editing starts. And a lot of it might get chucked away, but at least exactly. I'm being productive. And, and that thing of, 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 of sort of how you view things is so important. I remember at one point reading somewhere, you know, and this is where advice can help, which is why I think we're having this conversation, even though we say there are no rules at one level, but advice can help. I remember reading, and it sounds obvious, but it sort of hadn't occurred. I was writing my fiction, my story, in a linear fashion. I was writing one chapter after the other. But then I read somebody who suggested, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you really want to write that dinner party scene, uh, but it's, you know, three chapters along or it's toward, or the end. You want to write the end of the book now, then do it. Write the end of the book and then you can bolt it all together later and rearrange it as well. So you can write the scenes that yeah, enthuse yeah. you at the time and then rearrange it. And that was a really helpful idea. So really, there are no rules. Make your own rules as you go along, as we've said repeatedly. But and what are, what are a yeah. couple of okay, the other points okay. well, I've got two more you points, would really. say? One, which is that... Um, well, th three points. OK, if you have a debilitating inner critic or if you find it really you've got a perfectionist inside you and you keep honing your work and you keep thinking it's not good enough. And all I say, the advice a, a friend of mine who was a journalist said, uh, and I resisted it, but then I did it was start a blog. Because with a blog, you write something and then you hit the publish button and it's too late. You know, the, somebody's somebody's reading it um, and it's a way of training yourself 
to to not always listen to the perfectionist. Something you said to me, uh, which was so helpful, was you took the concept of the good enough mother that the psychologist uh, Winnicott came up with, a brilliant idea, you know, yes. that mothers always want to be the perfect mum. And he said, essentially, you know, no, there's a good enough mum, you know, don't go for perfection. And you transferred it to the idea of books. And you said, I think there's the idea of the good enough book. You know, it may not be perfect, but it's good enough. And that frees you up tremendously. So starting a blog, the good enough concept. The, the, the final point I think I'd like to make is it's a little technique. I don't know if you've come across it, but if you're finding it hard to write, you've got the blank page syndrome, the writer's block syndrome you're sitting there. And you don't know what is if you if you're using a piece of paper, you just draw a line down the middle of the piece of paper and on the left hand side, write how you're feeling. And on the right hand side, write what you want to write. So so you might start off on the left hand side saying, my God, I feel awful today. Uh, I'm I'm really scared to put pen to paper or, you know, whatever. And you just write your thing. And at some point you flip over to the other side and you'll start writing. You know, it was a dark and stormy night on the moors, you know, mm -hmm. and, so on. <laughs> and then and then you might flip over to the left and say, God, that was a cliche. I shouldn't have written that. I think that's a really interesting idea. And once again, I can I can import that directly into therapeutic practice because one of the things that I often encourage people yeah. to do is to separate the thoughts and the feelings because they are two different things. You can feel yeah. like you want to kill your spouse, but you yeah, can yes, think exactly. maybe it's not a good idea, you know. And uh, so um, it's an important exercise. But I also think that for what you've just suggested, this idea of actually capturing uh, the sort of the inner dialogue in a way, isn't it? Of, of, or inner monologue, yeah, yeah, I suppose it is, yeah. having a... In a and and, and I've, I've, I've used this technique and, and I find that I can pretty quickly, I can sort of write a paragraph of moaning, essentially saying, why, why have I decided to do this? Or I say, and then it just gets, gets that out of the way and then I get into the content. Okay. But, and then the final point really is inspired by a quote from Grayson Perry, the potter, who said, you've got to be sit quietly in the forest clearing so that the little furry creatures can come out and can come into the clearing. And I love that uh, image because it resonates for me, me very much with my spirituality, as it were, which is, you know, I follow the, the, the Druid way, the way uh -huh. which is a sort of nature spirituality. And the central idea in Druidry is that you have to create really times when you attune to nature and you open to the powers of nature and the soul, the spirit, if you like. And so central image in Druidry is the sacred grove, the clearing in the forest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Grayson Perry has evoked that image too. And there's something about if you can... Uh, sit in the forest clearing and just go quiet and there are inspiration can come to you. You know, we started off by talking about Tchaikovsky's idea, didn't we, of, of, of uh, meeting inspiration halfway. And the, the meeting it halfway is, is creating situations where you do go quiet and still and maybe you meditate in a conventional way or maybe you just simply sit still and just just um just sit really and mm. be with yourself listen to the bird song etc and that gives a chance for your unconscious and perhaps the collective unconscious or the transpersonal as it's sometimes called in psychology to inspire you with an idea an image yeah. Yeah. and and often that's mm. all you need just one image a phrase maybe or a thought an idea in my terminology yeah. something to hang a it on hook. you know is always what I'm looking for when I when yeah. I start something new. Well, we've talked about essentially, mm -hmm. there seem to be two threads to this. And I, I think this could go on for hours, because I've kept my mouth shut, although it may not sound like it, you know, there are so many <laughs> other things I wanted to chip in with. One, I would just say about web writing, and you put it putting a post out there, for example, is I've got 1000s of posts, as, as you have on my blog. And um, I can revisit them or I, I'm forced to revisit or I choose to because somebody asked me something, I look them up. So when I revisit them, you can re-edit them. You can you yeah. can update things you can go back and edit. Yeah, on the web, which you absolutely. can't do on a printed page. And and yeah. so on a hard printed page. So that that's quite a handy thought. But we've we've covered and two sort of streams. One is this notion of the the inner writer you if how do you mobilize that person and keep that person at it we haven't talked a lot about how do you keep at it but how do you mobilize that inner that inner spirit to carry you forward into yeah. the world of writing and the other aspect that we've talked about is just practical stuff about how where and when uh to do yeah. it and we've said that you know really 
uh, waiting for inspiration isn't the best way to go about it. And uh, I think that's what stops so many people. And I've always said inspiration comes out of creativity, but creativity comes out of getting a bum on the chair and producing something, even if it's a line of drivel. And uh, so, you know, it might be journal writing, it might be writing a book, it might be post, but whatever, just write. And the other thing is the, the notion that actually uh, you make your own rules, but as I hope has come across in this, from both of us is that we actually have both of us spent quite a lot of time looking at other people's rules. How do other writers do it? And I never miss a You know, if I get a chance to read or listen to an interview with another writer, I always listen. You, you're always learning about that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they, writers come in many stripes and yeah. you have to discover whether you uh, have something of a writer in you before you can discover whether what that writer produces is any good or not. Absolutely. That would be my kind of closing point. So have you got anything to say before we go? By the way, I think we really should have a, a conversation about tru druidry uh, at some point in the future, because that's such a rich scene. Well, I'd that like would be great. And that would you. sort of follow on nicely, because there's a whole idea. Druidry is sort of centered around creativity and this idea of Arwen, this Welsh word, which means inspiration. And so sort of cultivating... So, you know, the, you know, we could we could look at the whole topic of cultivating inspiration. So, yes. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, you know, what a great way to make a living. Yes. I mean, we don't get paid yes. for this, but isn't it great to be able to do this sort of stuff? Absolutely. And uh, we're, we're fortunate that we can. Absolutely. So, Philip Cargom, thank you very much for your time and your erudition and your insight. You. And I look forward to speaking to you thank again. Thank you, Barry. All, All the, the best. best. Thanks. Bye. So that's it from me for this episode. Thanks again to Philip. And of course, my thanks to you for joining us on this little conversation. And please pass this on to other people if you think they may be interested. I'll speak to you again soon and there'll be more conversations as well as the usual ideas and uh, gizmos to help you get a better handle on life. This is me, Barry Wimbolt. Over and out. And speak to you soon, I hope.